All right, cool. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're getting pretty full here. So, so hi, my name is Will Anderson. Uh, I work over on the DevOps Collective, which runs PowerShell.org. Um, I sit on the board of directors as well as operate as the webmaster for the site. So if you guys are ever having a problem resetting your password or wonder why, you know, your um, you know, post isn't up online or something like that, I'm the guy that you wind up talking to. Um, I'm also a PowerShell uh, MDP. Sorry, I'm trying to turn off my phone so it doesn't bug us anymore. I'm a Microsoft MVP in PowerShell. Uh, I've also written, you know, helped co-author Master PowerShell Tricks Volume 2. So, uh, you know, done a lot of DSC work in there as well as some uh, scripting regarding uh, System Center Configuration Manager. Uh, my background is I'm a security patch management and compliant SME. So uh, I've been working in the security compliance and configuration management space for about 20 years. So, we're talking about desired state configuration today, why you should use it, and how, how does it work. So, desired state configuration uh, came out with PowerShell version 4. Um, it was a PowerShell-based way of being able to maintain uh, compliance over systems outside of GTO. Uh, basically, the configuration document that you create also can serve as a auditable document. So when you're going through audits, uh, it's very easy. It's very readable declarative language that allows you to be able to take it to an auditor and they can look at it and say, okay, this is how the configuration is done. Uh, you can very simply test against it. Uh, this gives you sustainable, enforceable security and compliance in the environment, regardless if you're on the domain or off domain and also reduce drift in your environment. You can maintain consistency between your non-production production environments using the same configurable document. So today we're gonna start talking about what DSC is, uh, how to build DSC configurations, how to create your own DSC resources, kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how it works. So this is more for somebody that's been curious about DSC, maybe been playing with it a little bit, and is still trying to kind of get their head around it. Um, how many people are just kind of looking at DSC and haven't really dealt with it a lot? Excellent. Uh, how many people actually find DSC configurations when you look at them a little bit intimidating? Yeah, a couple. Okay, cool. So, we're going to just go ahead and jump straight over into code and crack open my next ISE session. All right. Also, uh, just this morning, uh, I, I noticed something in Azure while I was standing up my environment. And I thought it looked kind of cool. Um, have you guys noticed? this yet? Eh, is that going to be cool or what? I can't wait to start power shelling from my Android phone. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, we're going to kind of look at a uh, simple configuration document. You can actually look at DSC configurations using, using the uh, snippets here. Um, it's very much built like a function. Uh, you declare a configuration instead of a function, then a simple name. And then underneath, uh, you declare what nodes you're running against. Now, the, the wisdom used to be that this is where you kind of declared your system names. Um, so if you wanted to build a configuration, you would specify what the system names were that this would go against, and we'd go ahead and create the configuration document. Um, conventional wisdom today is you want to really uh, declare the node as local host in most cases because the configurations that you're going to be building are a little bit more genericized and you use configuration data instead to declare what systems get what configurations as opposed to stating a configuration for a specific machine. This gives you a little bit more a little bit more flexibility and scalability. 
might put this thing in presentation mode. Where's my mouse? I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning, can you tell? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, so conventional wisdom is that you declare the name as the local, uh, the node name as local host, and you use configuration data to assign what systems get what configurations as you go along. Um, underneath is where you start declaring the actual configuration itself. Uh, this is defined by different resources that you'll uh, call out. Each resource uh, has kind of its own input parameters and we're gonna start getting into that here uh, right now. So you can see here we've got uh, Windows feature, friendly name, this is one of the ones that it uses in the, in the example here. Um, what we can do is we can actually use get DSC resource. Oh, now the pressure's on. to take a look at that specific DSC resource. Now, if we use it with no input parameters other than the name of the resource itself, it's going to give us kind of a generic outlook of what the resource looks like. Of course, I have a million modules stuck in my machine, so it's gonna probably throw some errors at me too. Good morning, Jeffrey, how are you doing? What's that? Uh, not too late, hopefully. Still feel like I need a little bit more coffee. I think my machine does too. <laughs> so you can, <laughs> so you can see here, uh, I, I've managed to pull up um, the uh, resource provider for Windows Feature, and you can see I've got actually got multiple versions installed. Um, the DSC does support side-by-side uh, -side versioning uh, as well, so we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But this gives you the ability to kind of see what uh, resources you have available and what versions you have. Now, um, it's really important, and we'll be talking about this a little bit later, to keep what version in mind that you have running when you're uh, putting together your configurations. But the more important thing is that if we use the syntax parameter, it will actually give us a nice little code snippet that gives us a little bit more information about how to put this together. No, yes. Is that looking okay? Awesome, okay. So anyway, this is one of the cool things that um, the PowerShell team put together for us is they actually gave us kind of a little bit of a template when you call the syntax parameter that we can copy and paste straight into our document. But it also gives us a little bit of a look into uh, how the DSC resource works and what's needed in order to be able to uh, use it effectively. So you can see here, uh, we have the name of the resource provider and then uh, you have to give it a friendly name. So uh, usually I try to give it a stateful name, but don't you know make it too long. Uh, so basically uh, after that, you have the input parameters that it's required. You have to call out the name of the, uh, the Windows feature that you're using, which I'll show you how to scrape that in a little bit. And you can see that name, unlike the other parameters, is not encapsulated in brackets. This means it's a required parameter. You have to absolutely fill it out. Uh, after that, you'll have credential, which, um, now minute, let me back this up. So this is essentially a key value pair system. Uh, on the left, you have the key that's the input parameter required, and then the value is over on the right. And you can see from the right side, it tells you what data type it is required in order to be able to put it together. 
So the name is Simple String. Uh, you'll see that credential um, is a PS credential. Uh, the depends on, um, you can actually use uh, an array of inputs. Now, depends on, ensure, and PS DSC run as credential are uh, three param inputs that you'll see regularly with DSC resource providers. Uh, depends on is when you set up a dependency on a previous uh, DSC resource provider. So say um, you're configuring a system center distribution point. You know you have to have WMI6 uh, compatibility on it, but you also need IIS, and IIS needs to be installed before you can install the WMI compatibility. Uh, you can actually tell the WMI compatibility resource provider that you're setting up, look for an IIS resource, and make sure that it's in the desired state before you try installing. Um, and then along with that, uh, you have ensure, absent, or present. Typically, this means make sure that the uh, configuration is there or not. Uh, so in the example for Windows feature, uh, perhaps you want to make sure a feature is removed from the system. You would use ensure absent versus ensure present, which tells you to make sure that the feature is there. Um, and then PSDSC run as credential allows you to pass a credential from a master configuration or configuration data to the resource to run as that particular account. Uh, this is kind of useful if you're using like Active Directory configurations, kind of maybe uh, building out the uh, required OU, creating a specific user or something along those lines. So uh, aside from those, you can also see that Windows feature also has include all sub features. Uh, this is a parameter that when you're using like install Windows feature, uh, you actually have that parameter available to you. So anything underneath the, the larger feature gets installed. And then you also have log path, which is uh, specific to Windows features, so you can actually specify where that login goes. So we're gonna just go ahead and scrape that real quick. I would use clip uh, to just clip it and paste it, but I've got two resources and I don't wanna grab both of them. So you just take it, paste it right in your document, and now we can go ahead and start putting this together. So we're going to just go ahead and give this a friendly name. And one of the favorite things that I like to do on all of my servers is remove the UI. <laughs> Yay, I got points. Um, so how do we know what the name is? If we do a get Windows feature, actually I've got to do it in my RDP session because I'm on Windows 10. Essentially, Windows 10 has a get Windows feature, doesn't it? Nope. Yeah. Um, yes, it's an installed component. So let me grab my RDP session again here real quick. Wake up. Did I use my connection? By the way, saw this this morning. Very cool. <laughs> I think the Wi-Fi is misbehaving again. Now you're saying you're connected. Yeah, we'll try one more time. If not, I've got code something. Did everybody uh, 
make their send their uh, stuff over to the demo gods this morning. Okay. I don't think get Windows optional feature has the same input. Yeah, I know. I'm testing it on my other screen before I... Yeah, no, it's not going to work. Okay. So if you were to use um, get Windows feature on the server platform, it would come back with a feature name. I'll show you what this looks like. Here. Um, so I believe it's underneath the, the name property uh, when you pull it up. And that would be what you would go ahead and scrape and then put into the name field. And then we can see here that I've got ensure absent, which is going to tell it, remove it straight off of the, the machine when you run the configuration. Um, you can see that I don't have any of the other parameters called out because once again, they're optional and they're not really required for me to, to handle. Now, uh, any questions so far? Yes? No? Okay. So, now what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and update some of this stuff. So, let me just go ahead and give my configuration a name as we discussed. We're going to go ahead and call it out to localhost. And we're going to go ahead and get rid of this second example here. So now we have a basic configuration. Um, we're going to just go ahead and run that real quick. And now um, I've gone ahead and I've loaded this into memory. So if I do. If I call it out like I do a function, it goes ahead and runs and generates a moth file. Anybody here not know what a moth file is? Okay. Well, that's going to cut about five minutes off of the, the talk. Now, a moth file is managed object format. Um, it's an open uh, document that is used pretty widely, uh, not just on Windows, but Linux platforms. So what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and just kind of take a look and see how that document is generated in here. So. Now, uh, like I said, this generates this in managed object format. If you've done anything with SCCM, you might be really familiar with MOF files because it uses it on the regular. But you can see here, it's uh, gone ahead and given us a little bit of information, the target node, uh, or target node, who created the document, when it was done, and where it was done at, as well as the resources that are being called out. Um, and that's essentially it. Now, when we've created this document, we can actually go ahead and uh, do a test deployment. And I'm kind of hoping that I can get my desktop connection working so I can do that for you. Or else this is going to be a really, really short demo. I actually tried finding Tobias this morning and I couldn't get the speaker Wi-Fi password. Looks like I might have a remote desktop, though. And cut. Oh. It's letting me authenticate for the details.
Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. I'm floundering here. Had a great party last night or what? I didn't drink that much, I promise. <laughs> oh, that's what it is, yes. As I drink my two cups of coffee. Yay. Thank you, sir. Oh, that last that worked excellent. That's good. As you can see, this system's already got the UI removed. Now you, you'll actually see that I have the UI management tools installed. Um, that is actually purpose. And I'll talk about that in a second, but we're going to go ahead and uh, generate this mock real quick and then get the ball back on track. All right, so now we can go ahead and test our configuration. So when you go ahead and generate a MOF uh, using PowerShell, uh, it actually does a little bit of a test config for you. So if you were to put in a value that it doesn't like, um, you know, like uh, we'll just go ahead and change this to a numerical value. And you try to generate a moth, it's going to spit it back at you. Or not, because apparently 32 is valid, valid input. Yeah. So let's try. Oh, let me see this. Uh, why do you have to be so difficult, Jeffrey? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. So let's do this. Oh, I can show you the Get Windows feature now. So, yeah, you can see the name here. This is what it's actually going to be looking for. So we're going to go ahead and scrape this one. And scrape this one. So we go ahead and pick it. And it's going to blow up. So PowerShell actually does a little bit of testing on the front end for you. Kind of makes it nice. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just kind of regenerate this. And get a
However, uh, you don't necessarily know where that friendly moth came from. It doesn't necessarily have to have been generated by PowerShell. So, yes. You could. Um, so basically when you generate the moth file, what it does is it works in the present working directory that you're in and then creates a folder uh, with the configuration name. So you can always um, direct it, you know, pretty much wherever you want. All right, I forgot where I was going. All right, making up. Yes. All righty. So now we've gone ahead, we've got our moth created. Um, so we're going to go ahead and target a remote system and fire this against it. So I've got some test systems in the environment that I use to validate my configurations. So what we can do is we can do start DSC configuration. Path to the directory. Now, uh, one of the things that I have to note is that with path, do not call out the full path, including the file name, uh, because it's going to actually expect you to, it's going to expect a directory only. Uh, when I was first learning desired state configuration, I was like, why is it not finding the stupid file path? And it was because I had the, the file name in there. So a little bit of a gotcha that you should be aware of. Uh, computer name, call out the local host node. And we can go ahead and fire this off. And you can see the configuration is running. Now, while this is running, we're going to go ahead and just uh, talk about the local configuration manager real quick and how you can kind of see what the state is. So, get DSC local configuration manager will give you the DSC local configuration manager. This is the agent that runs on PowerShell 4 and 5 that kind of handles the, the configurations themselves. Uh, you can see some basic config information. Uh, the stuff that you kind of want to pay particular attention to is the configuration node. Uh, reboot node if needed, which is a really uh, important one. And then action after reboot. Um, Basically, configuration mode, there's a number of uh, modes available. Um, apply an auto, or was it, sorry, I gotta refer to my notes real quick. You're making me nervous, Jeffrey, stop looking at me. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Okay, so you currently have uh, four uh, configuration modes. Uh, apply only, which is the default, I believe, uh, which is basically set it once and then forget it after that. Just don't uh, do perform any other actions. You have apply and monitor, which uh, you'll basically, it applies the configuration once doesn't necessarily make any changes, but will do consistency checks to validate if the system continues to remain in the desired state or not. Uh, you have apply and autocorrect, which basically, if somebody tries to change one of those set configurations uh, after the designated time, which is set for, uh, what's that, 30 minutes, um, it will go ahead and put it back into the state, yes. Um, basically, oh, actually, I'll get into that in just a second. Um, so, and then I said there were four. Uh, apply only. Apply and monitor. Apply and autocorrect. 
Zayn. Apply only and apply monitor. Apply auto correct. Yes, those are. Is apply no, there's no. Well, that's apply only. So it applies on the first one and then, yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. So reboot note if needed uh, by default is set for false. Um, so basically, if you're applying a configuration for the first time and you don't do anything with the local configuration manager, it's going to uh, essentially get to a point, it could essentially get to a point where it goes into a pending reboot state and will not continue the configuration until it gets manually rebooted. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the document right now and I only see the three, but I could have sworn there was a four. I don't think there is. No. No, it takes a hash table for the seven. <laughs> I actually grabbed the MSC and document because for some reason I can't find my notes. So, um, anyway, with the, the reboot note, if needed, like I said, by default, it's set for false. Um, so, if you want to configure your system and ensure that all the appropriate reboots are going to happen, you need to make sure that it's going to be set to true. Uh, we're going to actually talk about how you would go about doing that in just a second here. And then, uh, action after reboot uh, is another one that you want to pay attention to. Uh, by default, uh, it's continued con configuration, but it can be set to stop configuration. This is actually something that's important to look for in Azure. Uh, I've seen instances where occasionally when you're installing the, uh, the SC extensions for Azure, it will actually change the reboot node if needed and continue configuring or the uh, action after reboot values. Sometimes it does it temporarily, but if there's a problem with the agent, uh, it might have those settings stick, and then you'll be wondering why your configuration's kind of stuck in that, that limbo. So. Questions so far? All right. So how do we change that? Well, there's um, basically a way that you can call this out in your configurations with a provider called Local Configuration Manager. Now, at first glance, Local Configuration Manager looks like a DSC resource provider like Windows Feature does. But if you do get DSC resource, local configuration manager, you're not going to get anything back. This is because it's not actually a DSC resource provider. Um, basically, the local configuration manager is a class that DSC recognizes that allows you to pass a hash table of variables to configure the local configuration manager on a target machine. Now, when we go ahead and call it in here. We can go ahead and see that we've got the reboot node if needed set to true. We've got the configuration mode set to apply and auto correct. Now, if we go ahead and generate or rerun our configuration and call it out again, we're going to see now that two MOF files have been created. You have the configuration MOF, and then you have the meta MOF which is the meta configuration file for the DSC local configuration manager. This actually creates it separately. Um, so th this is one of the things that you want to keep in mind when you're applying configurations. Also another thing that you want to be mindful of when you're uh, operating in the Azure environment, because I've actually seen people target the metamoth file instead of the configuration file because it generated both when they published the, the document.
Is there? Ooh. Do you want to walk me through that? Oh, I learned something today. Let's give a round of applause for Mr. Jeffrey Snow for everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, and now I don't. That is cool. I did not know you could do that. All right. So now we have a way to be able to, to set our uh, hosts with the, the local configuration. Now, this is uh, something that you don't do with uh, start DSC configuration, but you do it with set DSC local configuration manager. But much in the same way, you give it a path. Don't give it the file name, you just give it the directory and then the computer name. So we can go ahead and kick that off, and you'll see that the local configuration manager has been set. Um, well, I'm specifying local host. So if I do this against a remote machine, uh, but if I'm using a local host moth, I need to specify that, that uh, configuration. Fine. Okay, no problem. <laughs> All right, so we, we've kind of looked at some of the, the baked in uh, local resources that we have out of the box. Uh, you can see that Windows feature, uh, let me go ahead and pull that in. Windows feature actually belongs to a module that's uh, one of the default or the default module that you get on the Windows platform PS desired state configuration. Um, but what if we want to get something that's uh, you know not necessarily in that module? Um, actually, I'll go ahead and show you what is available in that. So. So you can see the list of um, DSC resource providers that we have in the PS Desired State Configuration module, but it doesn't do everything. So what do we do if we you know, want to do something else? Well, the PowerShell gallery actually has a really good repository of all kinds of DSC resources that we can use. Uh, if you're running WMF5, you can do find module um, and it will go ahead and pull from the PS Gallery repository so you can kind of get a list of all of the cool stuff that's available. WMF4, not so much. Uh, you've got to go to PowerShellGallery.com, uh, look up the resource there, and then um, find the configuration that you're looking for. However, there is a wealth of information there that is um, available to you as far as what resources and scripts and whatnot are available, um, as well as gives you some of the project information, uh, who created it, licensing, which if you're operating in an, in an enterprise that loves to throw lawyers at you for open source stuff, uh, it's, you, know, you can pull up the license info for that. Uh, and then you can also go to the project site for those specific resources and go ahead, download the necessary series files and install them manually. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, um, you know, basically uh, grab some networking files that we need to create some firewall rules. The X networking resource is one that we can use. So we're going to go ahead and look for that module. One of the things to keep in mind, too, is that you can actually pull down specific versions. So occasionally, as you know, they start iterating through newer and newer versions, they might add some additional features 
in newer versions of the module that aren't available in older versions. This doesn't necessarily seem like a big deal unless you're, you have a configuration that's using an older version and you don't want to just assume, you know, get the latest one because it might break something. And actually, the X firewall resource is a really good example of that. Um, it's been changed so vastly from older versions to newer ones that uh, you can actually break a configuration if you pull down uh, too new of a version and you created it with an older one. So we're going to go ahead and do a find on this and just install it. And then you're going to get a little bit of a prompt asking you to install the NuGet agent. So, of course, we trust everything from the PowerShell gallery, so we're going to just click yes to everything. And then you'll see here, if we do get DSC resource, okay. And you can actually see I've got like bazillion versions installed because I am actually using multiple uh, versions in my uh, configuration that I used to build it out in Azure. Um, but you can see here we've gone ahead, we've installed the module, and you can see all of the uh, available rules and whatnot for it. So I want to go ahead and create a new firewall rule. So let's look at X firewall. So you can see there's a lot of stuff in the X firewall uh, resource provider. And actually, uh, with multiple versions, you can see here, uh, this is one of the older versions here, where it's got, you know, maybe, what is it, 12, 13 uh, different input parameters. This is one of the newer versions, and how it's got vastly more. But one of the things that it actually changes is the uh, authorization for allow or deny. It actually changes the key name uh, in one of the modules. Uh, so the later version calls it one thing, the older one calls it another. Uh, I didn't actually find that out until I did the deployment and all of my firewall rules exploded. So uh, this is why side-by-side -side versioning is good, uh, but it's also a good reason to, or a good thing to keep in mind when you're uh, working with potentially newer versions against older configurations. So I'm lazy, and I don't want to go through and type all of those individually, so I have already pre-baked configuration here that I'm going to just go ahead and snag. And go ahead and throw it in here. Like which uh, modules it's using? Uh, yes. Um, and basically, you can take a look at the installed modules, but you can also look at the configuration file, which I was about to show you how to import those modules. Um, so right here, you can see here, uh, you got a little blue squiggly with the X firewall resource, and all of the just, uh, input parameters are in blue. It's because the module itself is not yet imported. Uh, so what we have to do is we do like we have up here. And I've already stated it, but there's uh, a way that the way that the configurations do when you do a uh, copy paste, it likes to keep it squiggly until you recall it or you actually call the correct version. So let's do so you can see the squiggly's gone away in the import DSC resource. Now, this is another thing that I have to call out because if you're operating in Azure, it made a significant difference. Um, so Azure used to run primarily in PowerShell 4. And if you just use the parameters to call out the module name and the module version, uh, there was actually kind of a weird quirk when you created the zip file to publish the DSC configurations. 
it would actually create a new directory for every file that that resource had, uh, unless you instead cast those properties to a hash table. Uh, now, uh, Azure runs in PowerShell 5, you don't necessarily have to do the um, hash table, you can actually call out the individual parameters. But force of habit, I'm still using the hash tables. But we've gone ahead and you can see the, the red squiggly's gone away. And if we look at our firewall rule, you can now see that it's looking correct. So this is kind of a nice little visual uh, nomer that, hey, you know, you might want to to validate your uh, DSC uh, resources are being imported correctly. I think we got a 10 minute break. Okay. So one of the things that, I, I guess we'll go ahead and start. Uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention was that out of the box you get the PS desired state configuration module, but Microsoft has actually been doing regular updates to that module in the form of XPS desired state configuration that's available on the PowerShell gallery. This actually has a ton more features than the PS desired state configuration module that you get out of the box. I highly recommend that you use it. Um, and we're going to just go ahead and not have our cursor in the correct window and get that installed. Full screen. Oh, that's better. That is much, much better. Is it big enough for you now? So we're going to just go ahead and get this kit and go ahead and put this in. And now we've got that all there. So before I go ahead and generate this MOF, I want to talk to you guys about something that I call the resource of shame. Um, there is a resource in PS Desired State Configuration and also the um, XPS desired state configuration called the script resource. Now, if we look at the script resource, we're going to just go ahead and pull this up real quick so we can take a look at it. You'll see that there's three required parameters, get script, set script, test script. Um, in, basically, this allows you to be able to take some of the, the scripts that you use and use them directly in a DSC resource in order to be able to configure a system. Now, typically, when we're writing scripts, we're writing it to make a change or set something the, the way that we want. Now, the, because of the requirements here, we also also have to do some additional scripting to test whether or not the environment is in the desired state or not. Um, and then we also have to use a get to essentially return a hash table to va validate our inputs. The reason why I call this the resource of shame is that if you look at my script resource here, that is ugly. And the, the nice thing about DSC configurations is that typically it's basic key value pairs and it's very readable, very easy to kind of see what you're doing. But an auditor, when they start looking at code, uh, is going to probably declare you a witch and want you burned at the stake. So the, the other side of it too is that you're actually doing like two thirds of the work that you need in order to be able to create a DSC resource. So instead of making your configuration super ugly with, with this script resource, you might as well just do a little bit of extra work and you know create your own. So we're going to go ahead and do that. 
And as soon as I can find one. So the PowerShell team actually created a really cool tool called the PSDSC Resource Designer. Uh, it's under the module XDSC Resource Designer. So we're going to go ahead and install that real quick. And I should remember a pipe command. And when we get that module, you can see that we've got a series of commands here. Uh, import XDSC schema, which will allow you to import a DSC schema for class-based resources. You get new XDSC resource, which allows you to create the DSC resource, DSC resource property, which we're going to talk about in a second. And then you also have your tests and your updates. So the way this works is that basically it's going to create a template structure for you. So I went ahead and in a uh, earlier blog, I had actually created a uh, DSC resource called disk size. So we're going to just kind of use that as an example so I can show you how it works. Um, basically, what you have to do is you have to create your uh, parameters or your inputs before you can create the resource itself. So we need a disk size and drive letter. So resource property. Give me given name. We're going to give it a type. The type, of course, is the data type that is um, expected. So we want this to be integer, attribute. Now, attribute is something that's important to keep in mind. Uh, you've got four attributes that you can use. You've got key, read, required, and write. You have to have at least one key property. Uh, the key property is essentially something that is going to be uh, that needs to be unique in your configuration. So if you're going to call out the DSC resource provider multiple times, uh, you don't want that property to be able to be used more than once. So say, for example, um, you know, we have uh, disk drives that we want to resize. Maybe the disk label or the, the disk letter uh, would be something that we would want to be the key property so we don't have somebody that tries to configure the same drive with two different sizes in the same configuration at once. Make sense? Um, and then you also have uh, read, which we'll kind of get into a little bit, required, which is going to be that input parameter that you know absolutely has to be there. Now key by default is a required parameter, but you might have something else that is also required. So, for example, with the uh, disk size resource, I've got the drive letter and I've also got the size. Those are two things that logically you're going to need. So, if we're going to make the disk letter the key, then we'll just make the disk size be a required parameter and then that's going to go ahead and get input. Write is something that um, basically gets written to the configuration, uh, but not necessarily to any specific property. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, 
I'm trying to think of a good example because I never actually use write. Um, actually, I think uh, ensure is a write required property. So that would be something that you would write to the, the configuration document, but it's not actually something that you're putting into the system. Yeah? Mm -hmm. okay. So let's go ahead and we're going to make a required for the size. And that should be it for that. And we're going to go ahead and cast this to a variable. So we're going to go ahead and call this our size. And we'll call this one drive letter. Resource property. Uh, just for the sake of uh, sanity, I always call my variables the same thing that I'm calling the name just so I can read it. But you can pretty much call it whatever you want. Call it Bob. We're going to input this as a string. Uh, and also notice that you can actually have uh, array inputs as well. So if you wanted to be able to allow your user to input multiple values, you could. Tell me when. You're going to make me go all the way, aren't you? Is that good? Okay. So we're going to go ahead and make this a required property. Now, with this particular tool, it also um, wants you to create the insure, which is actually kind of a nice example anyway. And it is kind of logical, and I'll get into that more when we start talking about the constructs itself. So, aim. Oh, yes. Uh, good catch. That I was going to do the thing. I did not do the thing. Uh, and along with this, we're going to also create that validate set so we can have the absent or present. Alright, and then we're going to do new oops, DSC resource. Name. And we're going to just call this this test. Properties is where you put input your array of the properties that you've created. And then the path of where you want it to go. Oh, I don't have scripts in here. Yeah, what the hell? So we're going to also create the module name. So we're going to just call this this things. And then we're going to go ahead and pull the trigger. So we'll go ahead and run these. Now you can see here it's gone ahead and created the necessary directories and files. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at those. So, oh, 
Oh, yes. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is our manifest file. So basically the manifest file is um, your document that states you know, who created it, your module versioning, uh, all of the, the important kind of info here to be able to publish this to a local repository and get all of the information necessary out of it. Um, also, if you, you can actually use the same module directory that you're creating your DSC resources in and also put uh, function, a function mod or you know module file in there to also have some commandlet you know commandlets associated with it. So it's not necessarily that this is limited to creating a DSC resource. You can make it more of just a more widely varied toolbox. Uh, this is also really important that if you're creating functions that your DSC resource is going to be dependent on. Uh, you would put those in the same module directory that you would have your DSC resources in. So, for example, like um, I actually have a function that I created to create uh, uh, randomized strings for passwords and then also a PS credential uh, that my one of my DSC resources is dependent on. Those actually all exist, so I have the module file under the module name directory. And then I also have the DSC resources in the same uh, directory structure under DSC resources. So that way it all gets imported as a single module and I don't have to run multiple modules in order to be able to get my functions uh, imported and then the DSC config run. Yeah, here, let me show you. So, uh, no, it won't add itself. You have to add it. But like here, so I have this disk things uh, module file that I created. So we, we've got the module manifest, but this is also no, normally where you would put your PSM1 for your functions. So we just go ahead and create the new document. Oh. Yeah, you'd have to call it PSD. And then you can go ahead and start putting your functions in there. Um, and then the other thing that you have to, to remember is to just make sure that this is not uh, commenting out. So we've gone ahead and we've looked at the manifest file, but the other thing that it will create. is your DSC resources directory and in there you'll have the manifest for it as well as some schema mod. So this is actually what declare you know creates the, the class resource for the DSC resource. So it knows how to look it up and import it into the DSC configuration. The other one that's really important, and actually is your most important, is the PSM1 file. This actually creates the basic constructs for your DSC resource. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and oh, oh, squash this. And you can see that, like the script resource, we have a get, set, and test target resource. Uh, script resource actually works almost identical to how a DSC resource works. Once again, this is why I call it the resource of shame. You're already there, man. Uh, you just have to create a couple extra lines of code, create your uh, template, and then you 
throw your code in there and it's going to make things a lot cleaner. But, um, so you, now we have to go ahead and fill out these, these three functions. So get target resource. This is one thing that I see a lot in people's online blogs. So get target resource has to return a hash table. That's the only requirement. The hash table doesn't actually have to have anything in it. Don't do that. Um, a lot of people in the blog posts that I see actually create uh, just an empty hash table because they don't want to run through the work of, of you know, creating the necessary hash table. But the, the PowerShell team actually for seeing this in their template gave you a commented out hash table. So now you don't have to return a blank hash table. Um, why is this important? And this has actually been something that's been a debate a lot uh, in the online community. Uh, the reason why some of us feel that this is very important is that, okay, well, the argument against the get resource is that basically the, the view is it's supposed to validate your inputs going into the, the resource. But the thing is, is that when you're using PowerShell to, to generate a moth, it already does that for you. It reads through the config and makes sure that the values that you're inputting when you're creating the moth file are actually what the resource expects. The problem is that, you know, we're using moth, managed object format. It's not something proprietary. It's something that anybody can create. You can create one in Notepad++ if you really like torturing yourself. But more importantly, uh, whatever creates the moth may not necessarily be looking at those DSC resources and validating your inputs. So this kind of acts as a catch before it tries and goes ahead and you know update or issues a configuration with some bad data. Um, essentially what it's doing is it's looking at your input parameters, validating that the data type that uh, the resource is looking for is what your inputs are, and then it says, okay, the inputs look good, we're going to go ahead and move on to test. So that's my really long-winded answer to don't leave the hash table empty. Just uncomment it. It takes literally five seconds to do. Um, now, you'll see that set target resource is uh, the, the second one that the template generates. Uh, I'm going to kind of brush over that and go straight into the test one because the set is by far the easiest. The test target resource is actually the hardest. Now, test target resource, the only requirement for test is that it has to return a Boolean statement, true or false, which Sounds pretty easy. You, you can do an if statement and do a pretty quick check and get a true or false back, right? Yeah? Pretty, pretty simple. Now let's talk about arrays. Um, for example, like the, the test uh, or the script resource that I had was to check drives to see if it had a no SMS on drive file on certain drives except for the one that I was excluding. Anybody familiar with SCCM? Okay, so you know what the no SMS on drive file is. Um, well, when in, in there's also a cardinal difference in PowerShell 4 and 5 and how it handles this. But um, so basically I was looking at an array of disks. I'd say look at all the disks except for E drive and it would parse through all of the attached disks except for E drive to see if no SMS on drive file is in existence. Now, the way PowerShell 4 and 5 handle this are different. In PowerShell 4, when you were doing DSC and you fed it and you had a test set up and it returned an array of Boolean statements, it would look at the last one and it would go off of the last one. So if last returned true and all of the other ones were false, they would assume true and then keep on going. Uh, PowerShell 5, they actually 
realize that this was a problem and uh, it does a check and if it sees an array of Boolean statements, it's going to actually come back and go, no, you, you need to fix your, your test statement. So that's, that's where the difficulty kind of comes in to how things get written effectively. Uh, so that's something that you really want to be cognizant of when you're writing your test. Uh, be mindful that A, it has to be Boolean, B, it has to return a single Boolean statement. Questions? Pretty straightforward? Okay. And then I'll be able to show you why my previous one is horribly broken because I wrote it in PowerShell 4. Set is pretty easy. Do the thing. So basically, when it when you know you go through your test, it validates, and if it returns a false statement, it moves on to the set uh, statement. Now this one gets a little bit funky because you know you're operating in multiple functions here, so you really need to make sure that even though you're doing the tests, you need to do some type of validation to make sure that your targeting is correct and your set statement. Um, so you always want to be mindful of that. Now with my no SMS on drive file, I don't care. I just, you know, tell it to write the file and overwrite it if it already exists. But yeah, some things might be a little bit sensitive to being overwritten. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, that's basically how you create a DSC resource. And we can take a look at one that I created that was horribly written. And we can pick it apart. And actually, while we're also on that topic, I think it's in here. No, okay, no, no. I had actually written a hybrid um, resource, but I didn't install it on this system. So, so let's talk about test. So you can see that the way this one is configured. If I do drive letter. And then, what's a good disk size? <laughs> yeah, we'll go with 42. I like 42. Okay. So you can see that this one, you know, kind of does a pretty simple uh, true or false statement. But if I look at my script on here for my test, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and change this to. I don't know. F will work. I don't think I have F on here. What did I miss? I have too many, don't I? Okay, so you see how I have an array of falses here? This is where it would actually break. So if I went ahead and copied this, 
new to my task. I'm going to close that one so I don't mess with it. And dump it here. Well, actually, that would I'd have to rebuild the uh, DSC resource. Um, do you guys kind of get where I'm going with that, though? So basically, you have to return a single boolean for a false statement. If you do more than one, it's going to error out. All right, how much time do we have? How much time do we have? No worries. Um, how much do we have without the break? 30? Okay, cool. Awesome. So, any questions so far? For um, so the only time that I would do it, and actually I should have it installed on here. So let me let me see if I've got it, and I'll show you real quick. I have a lot of modules installed on here. Really, the um, the only time that I would say that you want to create the hybrid modules is when you're actually creating functions specifically for your DSC resources. Um, that way you're not creating a separate module that has those functions and then another module that has the DSC resources. You just want to have them in a, in a single directory. Um, I'm going to see if I can find uh, one of the hybrid modules that I've created here. So we can kind of go through that. Super fast internet, go. Yes. Yes, I totally trust this file. Please download it. All right, let me just go ahead and pop this open real quick, and then I'll show you how it works. So a little while ago, I had a uh, issue where I needed to do some um, work with the local security uh, policy settings, and there weren't really any um, good modules for that. So what I did was I actually pilfered uh, a script that another MVP had done Open. 
So, uh, Tony Pombo created a uh, script that would allow you to kind of set local user rights assignments. Uh, what I did was I grabbed that and I turned it into a series of functions. So, just go ahead and squish them down here. Um, so, be able to grant user rights, revoke them, uh, and then get them. And actually the gets I created specifically for the purpose of my tests was to be able to go and see what the current state was and then, you know, the grant would go ahead and allow me to set it. So this function actually exists in the same directory structure as... Let's see. Uh, it exists as a module file in the DSC resource uh, uh, directory that I created. So you can see here, I've got my get target resource with my filled in hash table. Um, I've got the test target resource. And you can go ahead and see how the test is configured here. Um, and then I have the set target resource. So basically, this is where I'm using that module file to have those functions already imported using the, the same module structure as my DSC resource. So that's, that's really why, when you would go ahead and do the hybrid uh, setup there. So... And then, of course, here's the manifest file for it. And then one of the things that I did have to call out in the, the manifest file was to make sure that it actually looked at my uh, module file to import those commands. Clear as mud? Questions? All right. So let me grab one more thing here. Going to bonus round. Yay. So, does anybody know who Ashley McGlone is? He goes by the moniker GoTPFE on Twitter. All right. If you ever get a chance to, to um, you know, introduce yourself to him. I, I highly recommend it. He's he's just an amazing person and very cool to hang out with. Um, he actually trying to find a he created a script. There we go. Helper function to create a PowerShell DSC composite resource. Anybody here not know what a composite resource is? Okay, cool. So we've created our our uh, DSC configuration, right? Say, say for example, you have a DSC configuration for, uh, you know, you decided, you know what, images aren't the way we're going to go anymore. We're going to go DSC, man. And instead of doing an image, we're going to build a configuration and we're going to apply it to all of our machines. It's awesome, right? But say, uh, you know, you've got this base configuration, but now you want to also do like SQL Server and uh, build that as a DSC configuration. Well, you're not going to take that SQL Server configuration and then stash it in your, your uh, base configuration file, are you? And it doesn't make sense. So, but how, how do you like be able to pick multiple configurations and, and create them, you know, put them all together in a single config? Well, that's where compositing kind of comes into play. And uh, like I said, Ashley uh, created this really cool script for basically taking your configuration 
and then turning it into a composite resource. Now you can do this manually, but I'm lazy and I don't like to create my own directory structures and module manifests and all that stuff. So his script is actually what does it for us, just like the DSC resource designer creates the, the templates for our new DSC resources. So let me actually make sure that I have that module installed before I open my big fat mouth. Yes, I agree. No, okay. So we're going to go ahead and scrape this. Now, if you if you look in here, he's got you know the the giant uh, disclaimer saying, hey, you know. Uh, if your stuff blows up, it wasn't my fault, don't sue me, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to just go ahead and kind of squish this down. Of course, he's got his help file in there, but here's the new DSC composite resource. And like I said, really the only thing it's doing is it's creating that the directory structure for you. So we're going to go ahead and give it directory path because I like sticking everything on C. Module name. And we're going to just call it Compres Resource Base Config. And then we're going to go ahead and pull the trigger. And you're going to see it goes ahead and creates a directory structure, but it also puts all this stuff together for you. Now, this is the really hard part. Uh, where's my configuration? really hard part is remembering what window I'm actually operating in. And I'm going to grab my DSC configuration. Of course you didn't. Well, with the exception of having to import my module, we're done. Uh, take this out. I have an extra one right here. Um, so basically all you have to do is in the, what it does is it creates a base con or creates a resource name dot schema dot PSM1 file, uh, which is essentially the same thing as your DSC configuration file. So uh, the only difference is it's also got a param block by default. But basically you take your configuration, you paste it in there, you're done. And now, um, yes. So if I go ahead and save this, and actually I'm going to just go ahead and install that real quick before. Yes. It's waiting for me to prompt. Oh, I guess not. And then install module. Three dot five dot zero dot zero. So this is going to be where it's really cool. So 
So we're going to go ahead and save this. And of course, because I was super smart and saved it in C, it's going to be easier for me to find. And I'm going to just go ahead and dump it into my modules directory. So, dump. Yes. So now we import module. Was it resource? And then if we go to create a new configuration, it's really hard looking at a screen at a 45 degree angle and using a mouse. And if I did this right, Of course. And go ahead and open up a new window and see if it uh, pulls it in. Anybody remember what I called that? Instantly. And we're going to see if it exploded or not. Any more questions? Anyone? Anyone? So. That's where module versioning comes in really, really handy. Um, so you can see I've actually got a version. Um, and what you don't want to do, and this is one of the reasons why side-by-side -side versioning is so important with DSC, is if you make significant changes to that base config, you increment your module version and republish. So that way you can actually have it side-by-side. -side. So if you have other configurations that are reliant on an older version, you can go ahead and you know keep that older version. However, um, you still kind of want to put a process in place for eventually moving those systems that are on an older base config into the newer ones, so that way you're maintaining uh, compliance in line with your corporate governance. So you can implement new changes immediately and then go back and hit the older systems and bring them up on your change process. So you can see that I've got the composite resource here. So I'm going to go ahead and start my snippets again. Sure. And then if we do this and with some deck and that. And then we're going to go ahead and, and you can see now I have my base config and the only thing I have to do, I actually don't actually have to put the depends on in there. However, I will tell you because depends on is actually doing nothing in here because I'm not stating anything in my configuration, but 
if you have the config and it's completely blank uh, or as called as a DSE resource provider, your auditor is going to want to know what the heck you're doing. Um, so I just put depend or and then I'll have it dependent on a different thing. Um, but technically, you can go ahead and have it blank. You can also put in an insure parameter um, and then just put the logic, you know, if insure equals present, then do this, you know, do the needful. So that's what the kind of default param block is for when you're creating, when you create the uh, new module directory off of the template and it's got it in there. Uh, it also allows you to pass other parameters. Like if you look at my base config, uh, I have a ton of gobbledygook in here for OMS. Um, so it basically downloads and installs my OMS agent, registers it with my workspace and all that stuff. You can actually create those instead of having hard-coded variables. Uh, you can actually put them in the param block and then pass it through via your config data so you can actually do it dynamically. If you've got multiple workspaces and stuff like that, uh, you can actually create the logic to go out, grab whatever workspace information that you need from your repository, pass it into the configuration data, and then it moves it along to the uh, resource as needed. So we have a, oh, oh, no, wrong window. So we're going to give this a nice name. Oh, wait, no, that's complex one. Oh, I do that. Snippets. DSC usable. Okay. So we just go ahead and tag this in here. Give it a friendly name. And then import the necessary okay. Ta da. What's that? Does it like keep shrinking it when I'm changing screens or? Okay. How's that? Did I put it in the wrong spot? I think I put it in the wrong spot. I need more coffee. Yeah, I put it in the wrong spot. There we go. Ta-da! Give me something, guys. Come on. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm on like three cups of coffee. I'm probably going to have a heart attack in about 45 minutes, so it'd be a bad idea if I have any more. Um, so basically what we've done is we've gotten through some of the basic understandings of how BSC works how to create a config, uh, how to create your own DSE resources, and then take those DSE configurations and themselves turn them into resources. Um, this should give you the basic fundamentals to, to be able to do DSE at your own workplace. And I highly encourage you, even, even if your managers are like, I don't know of this DSE witchcraft that you speak of, um, do a PS, POC on your own. Uh, I've done it you know, uh, on my own. I've, actually got a uh, Azure template that goes out, builds like an Active Directory domain and a couple web servers and throws PowerShell web access on it and does it in like 30 minutes. And I'll be talking to managers as it's standing up and then it all of a sudden comes up, you log in, you do your little song and dance and it starts changing minds. So I highly recommend that, you know, if you have the time and the, the resources at your fingertips, definitely do it. Please, any questions, any whatsoever? Uh, 
Um, I think by design, the get target resource was just to validate what the input data is. It's not necessarily to perform any tests. And this is where the debate uh, in, the, in the community has been. Uh, a lot of people are like, well, if you have test, what's the point? Because you're doing a test, it should also be testing the input uh, data. Um, but I think by design, when test is already committed, that resource itself is already starting to spin up in a, you know, pass or fail uh, decision mode. Whereas if you at get, provided you don't have dependencies, because dependencies kind of change how resources behave a little bit, um, but if there's no dependencies on it and a get statement uh, fails on a data type, it's not necessarily going to fail your config. So it's it's kind of where the, the debate in the community has been for a while on it. Like a true false statement? No. Uh, So the get target resource, uh, by design, you have to have it enumerate any input parameters that you're, that any required input parameters that you're stating. So they have to be there. Um, so unless your input parameters are Boolean, then you're not going to re return the, the true false statement that you're looking for. It's actually looking for does this parameter equal this data type? Um, and then it in itself will return a true false, but you can't, you can't build your test in there. Right, but that's what the purpose of the test target resource is. You, yeah, yeah, thank you. Redundant was a little bit too big of a word for me. I'm... Yes, any other question? Shoot. Um, I have a little, I don't use it in production yet. Um, primarily, the there was a problem and I think they've solved it with 5.1 where side-by-side -side versioning uh, wasn't permitted with class-based resources. Um, and quite frankly, I, I deal with a lot of enterprise customers and getting them just to use DSC, period, was a colossal undertaking. And trying to introduce classes to them is gonna just make their heads explode at this point. Other questions? Yes. So uh, the one mistake that I see the most with DSC is um, there's a huge difference between configuration management and patch management. Um, I've actually seen a couple of companies try to use DSC to define these are the patches that we want installed on the box. And it's like, have fun, dude because uh, if anybody here has done patch management, show of hands, okay, yeah. Are you gonna update your DSC config with 40 or 50 patch statements every month? <laughs> Keep telling yourself that. Um, so yeah, no, it's, that's probably the biggest mistake that I see made with uh, desired state configuration. Uh, the advantages are actually really numerous. So from a config management point of view, I can stamp out non-production or test, non-prod, and prod, all using the exact same config, and I know those boxes are consistently going to be the same across the board. Um, I also know that if I'm using apply and autocorrect, and SCCM guys again? Okay, how many of you, the, you SCCM guys 
have had a local administrator decide, because you're also using your distribution point as a file share, how many of you have had your local admin decide, you know what, I don't need IIS? None of you, really? Because that happens to me all the time. Um, so if you're using auto, apply and autocorrect, it's to keep people that are less than knowledgeable from doing harmful things to your environment. Um, but so it drift is important. Uh, compliance, very important. Auditing is huge. Um, because it's very, it's a very readable document. What are you doing and how are you doing it? It's, there's no code in it, there's no magic in it unless you're using the resource of shame, which I don't recommend. Um, but it's, it's a document that I've taken to auditors and they say, you know, what are you doing with these boxes? This is what I'm doing. Okay, prove it. And then you can use test uh, DSC configuration feed it an array of machines, it will return a true-false statement. And if one of those boxes is out of config, you start DSC configuration, reapply the config, and it's done. So those are the three strong points for it. Anyone else? So uh, with desired state configuration, you can either configure a pull server or a push server. If you're using pull server, it's got some reporting capabilities in it. Um, I am not a fan of on-prem pull servers because digging through the reporting, you basically uh, have to kind of build your own tooling to make it coherent. Uh, actually, Azure Automation DSC has a really, really, really cool reporting function in it. Um, and with the use of a hybrid worker, you can actually manage your configurations in the cloud for on-prem boxes. And that's something that I'll actually be talking about more tomorrow. So if you're really curious and want to see some really, really cool reporting that you won't get out of pull server, you might want to come to that. What's that? If you're using push, you don't get reporting. So you would have to use test DSC configuration against the, the remote machine. It'll return a true or false. Actually, um, we've got time, right? Okay, I'll go ahead and show that to you real quick. So if I do test DSC configuration, there it is. Uh, basically what it's going to do, actually I should have run that and, what did I do? Oh, yes, now I know what you meant by local machine. So, let's do this. So you'll see that I run it in verbose because it actually gives me what it's checking and what the state of it is. Uh, you can actually do a start transcript and dump that to a file and it, it's kind of nice. But the only output that you get is Boolean true or false. Is it there? Now there's also, um, which I don't believe this was available in PowerShell 4. Wow, that's loud. There's detailed. which will actually tell you what resources are in desired state and not in desired state. The thing that I don't like is the way it's formatted uh, because you have two different properties returning two different values in the form of hash tables. Um, I think it would have been nicer if it was actually, this is what the resource is and property true or false in desired state. Um, but that can give you some reporting at scale if you're using a push configuration. Can I answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm not saying that. I'm saying I don't like it. Um, so, and that's my own personal opinion. I'm not saying it's not effective because as a pull server, uh, getting the configurations out to the, the boxes, it's, it's exceptionally effective. But, um, like, I'm an idiot when it comes to reporting. Uh, quick side story. So, back when uh, SCCM 2007 was around, that used to be all of your reports were basically like real basic SQL queries. And then when R2 came out, they introduced this monstrosity called SSRS, um, which made me immediately break down into tears, and I never looked at reporting again, because I'm an idiot when it comes out to making good-looking reporting. So, you know, going through and, you know, the, the work required in order to come up with any type of dashboard or anything that's readable to a manager as far as reporting is, is a lot of work, and I'm lazy and I don't like working. Azure DSC um, gives me really nice looking reporting out of the box and I don't have to do any work. Win win. Chef is a great tool for it. And the, the really cool thing is that when Microsoft first started talking about desired state of configuration, uh, Chef like came over and said, "We want to talk to you about this." And you know, there was a little bit of interaction involved. So you can actually build your DSC configurations in native PowerShell and then import it into Chef so it can handle the config management and the compliance. Which, by the way, is something I highly recommend. Uh, I've seen way too many uh, enterprises where they go out and buy Chef, and Chef has all of these cookbooks, and they're like, oh, this is cool. I don't have to do any configurating or code writing, which is great until the company decides, you know what, um, XYZ company is a little bit cha cheaper, so we're going to change that tool. And then they have to scrap everything and move everything over there. If you're writing all of your config management in your native code, you can use any tool, Chef, Puppet, I think Ansible has support, not yet. So, okay, Chef and Puppet. But, you know, keep your code native for your config management and then import it into those tools to, to be used. Um, I, I'd, I'd still say it's not a bad thing to learn. I'm trying to learn Ruby because um, Jeff, but you know it's I, I would I would never say you know stop broadening your horizons. It's always good to have some backup skills. Any other questions? Fine. All right. Thank you for suffering with me for two hours on this topic. You guys have a great great conference.